Welcome to today's webinar, Enhance Your Public Health Searching Skills. This webinar is part of the network of the National Library of Medicine's Public Health Webinar Series. My name is Nora Barnett, and I'm an Outreach Specialist at the NNLM. Before we get started, let's go over a few housekeeping items. Attendees are muted to cut down on background noise. There is closed captioning available. To access closed captioning, select the closed caption icon. We will use the chat box for questions. When using the chat box, please select all panelists and attendees from the drop-down menu. For technical questions, please use the Q&A feature. Participants in today's webinar are eligible for 0.75 CHES continuing education credit hours. To claim your continuing education credit, please complete the evaluation at the end of the webinar. We'll put a link to that in the chat box at the end of the presentation. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the NNLM YouTube channel within two weeks. We're lucky enough to have with us today three expert public health trained librarians, Chris Alpe, Tova Johnson, and Laura Zygen, all from Oregon Health and Science University. They will tell you a little bit more about themselves and their background. So now I'll hand it over to Chris. We'll be asking you some questions as we go along. And also my colleagues will be, as we switch back and forth between presenting, we'll be monitoring the chat. And if we know that your question's not going to be answered in the presentation, we may um, interject and share that question and get it answered as we go along or save it for the question and discussion time at the end. But at the, we hope that after you spend this 45 minutes with us, you'll feel able to describe some more efficient approaches to retrieving public health content, be familiar with some of the gaps in discoverability between the terminology we as public health professionals use and the producers of the knowledge resources we're going to share today use, and then really talk about how to share information that you find from doing your searching with either your community of fellow public health practitioners and or the communities that you're serving who may be asking you uh, questions. So I'm Chris Alpe, I'm the University Librarian at Oregon Health and Sciences University and my public health degree from Hunter College was focused on community health education. Um, between 2002 and 2005, I directed the public health library at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And hello to anyone from um, NYC DOHMH who might be here today. And I wrote a paper that's open access called Expert Searching in Public Health that talked about some of the challenges being in a health department and trying to find information to address all the diverse kind of questions we received. And then my colleague Tova will introduce herself next. Um, hello, everyone. So I'm Tova Johnson. I'm a um, health sciences librarian at OHSU. And as a part of my role, um, I serve as the lead contact at OHSU for referrals from public libraries and the state library. And um, I also have an MPH um, from Emory University with um, a focus in behavioral sciences. Hello, everybody. And I am Laura Zagan. I am a health sciences education and research librarian at OHSU. Um, I am the OHSU Library's primary point of contact for the OHSU PSU School of Public Health. PSU is Portland State University, by the way. Um, and I am a, an MPH graduate of the Health Management and Policy Program in what is now the OHSU PSU School of Public Health. And we're all very happy to be here with you today because we think public university libraries like ours are really resources for their communities. So, um, This is our first question for you and feel free to share this in the chat. What questions about searching for information or connecting with health sciences libraries brought you to today's session? And again, if we address these in the presentation, great. If not, we can definitely discuss these at the end. So in terms of public health information that's available, looking both locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally can be important depending on the public health question that you're asking and where the resources might be. And I think this site, PH Partners, which is a collaborative between the National Library of Medicine and many other health organizations, associations, and governmental entities, 
is a good example of the kind of national approach to health information resources that you will find. When you have local or regionally based questions though, and that's often I think what happens to us working in public health, that source of information might really depend on who has the expertise and capacity to produce and disseminate information quickly. Um, we certainly noticed that here in Oregon when we were having the wildfires here, the idea of who had the capacity to produce information and get it online quickly kind of drove where people could find public health information about the impacts of the wildfires. Sometimes we need to take our local questions to a broader level because we don't have local information developed that's available online for us to find. And the best we can do is to find examples from other areas who have dealt with or studied similar issues. They might be the same size and scale of us. They may be different, but the question of what can we make relevant to our local question is I think always important. So these are the two example questions that we're going to work with today. The first is a question about the social determinants of health and how that impacts work in tobacco cessation. And Laura will work with that question. And then a question from an environmental health unit with community members wanting to investigate noise complaints in their residential neighborhoods and trying to understand the accuracy of noise measurement and how that works in relation to complaints that are made about air conditioning noise. And in both of these examples, we'll assume the user had already Googled as much as they could and still wanted more robust information, which is how these came to be search examples for us. Before I turn it over to Laura, I just wanted to share a few bits of insight from how we as librarians who are also trained in public health approach questions that may not be questions that were our questions, but were questions that were brought to us by others, in this case, our supervisor, or in my, the other example, community members. I think it's important to be very sensitive to the requester's way of knowing and their other sources of information. They've come to us in public health or libraries for information, but they also may be getting relationship information from others with whom they are in relationship, whether that's family members, other affected community members, their local health care providers, or community and advocacy organizations. And so understanding that our information exists in this environment of lots of different sources is also something we take into consideration. Um, ethical and legal issues, uh, public health questions can quickly become individual patient or legal questions, especially if they're asking us about evidence, risk, causality, or responsibility. So we are very careful to avoid making financial or value assumptions. And we always assume, in, we'll talk about this a little more in the sharing part, that even though um, we may suggest that information only be shared in certain ways, especially for copyright reasons. We also kind of assume that all the information we provide is going to be shared in some way with someone else. And so we're structuring our um, searches and results accord accordingly. Um, and lastly, the terminology and literacy issues, this idea that it's important to come to a shared understanding of the issues to be searched before we commence on searching. And one of the ways to look at this is whether there's a match between the words that are being used and what words you can actually use effectively to search. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that over the course of this webinar. So while, you, while we transition over to Laura, if you have a favorite online public health resource that you'd like to share with the attendees from this workshop, please feel free to put it into the chat. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. So I am going to talk about PubMed, which is a freely available interface to the Medline database of biomedical literature. It is, as we may say in uh, public health, a necessary but insufficient uh, resource for starting to get a picture of um, answering your questions. There's two basic ways to search PubMed. One is a keyword or basically a regular search. Um, on the front page, um, if you go to pubmed.gov, you'll see this big text box. And this is where you can type in the key concepts for your uh, search question. The other way to search is through MeSH or medical subject headings, um, which is the subject term controlled vocabulary that PubMed uses. 
to get to Mesh, one way to do that is from this main page in PubMed, if we scroll down, we would see this little globe and this column that says explore, and there's a link to Mesh database. I am explaining this now because in a few slides, I'm gonna refer back to this and you're probably gonna think, how do I get into the Mesh database? So that is the main way to get into the Mesh database directly from the main PubMed page. You just have to scroll down a little bit. <laughs> okay, so as Chris outlined, the question that I am exploring is how, how does food, food insecurity impact tobacco cessation programs? And I know that PubMed is one of the many resources that I need to check. Um, there is a link on this slide for how uh, tips on how to search PubMed, and there's other links on how to um, do the other kind of functions that I'll be talking about. And um, so the first thing that I might try is a keyword search, simply because it is the easiest place to start. I know how to do a keyword search. Um, this is the kind of search we do all the time in Google and whatnot. So I, in the PubMed main uh, search window, put in food insecurity, tobacco cessation. Notice I don't have to put in any ands or ors. Uh, PubMed kind of knows uh, to look at the, these concepts in that way. You can, but you don't have to. Um, now, after I search this, I am excited that I got results, but I am sad because I only got 12 results. And I have to think to myself, is this the amount of research and literature that I expected to get? If you suspect that there is maybe more to your search results set, <laughs> then you're going to want to expand your search strategy. One way to do that is to pour in additional concepts for each with each of our concepts. So um, I'm going to try to, with keywords and mesh terms, think of additional uh, uh, labels or terms for food insecurity that would get to that concept. I'm also going to do the same thing with the tobacco cessation concept. And um, basically, for those of you, um, I mean, I'm sure you know that the basic Venn diagram, what we're doing is we're kind of expanding each of the bubbles so that there's more real estate to possibly uh, find an intersection of our, of our question. So at this point, um, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. <laughs> um, I keep clicking on my screen because I don't remember that you're actually the one doing this. Um, so at this point, um, I might try a few other keyword searches, but this is where I may also get into the medical subject heading uh, database. And again, we get into that from the main page, scroll down and click on that mesh database link under explore. Um, I am going to go in here and explore my concepts one at a time. I uh, had the concept tobacco cessation. And when I search that in mesh, it maps it to tobacco use cessation. And when I <laughs> add this concept into the little box and you kind of can't see it, but if you click on the add to search builder button, that's on that page, it brings that syntax over. And when you click on search PubMed, it essentially, you're asking PubMed to, to find and bring up every article that has been um, assigned that mesh term. Um, it could be involving tobacco use cessation in a number of different areas that have nothing to do with food insecurity, but this is uh, kind of the first step. <laughs> As I said, we're trying to expand those little bubbles in the Venn diagram because we only got 12 uh, results first. So when I look up tobacco cessation, I see there's tobacco use cessation, I see also along the way, because if you explore these records, you're going to see a lot of other terms that are related. Smoking cessation, I see there's a prevention and control subheading, both for smoking and tobacco use. So you can see in the right, I search on these one at a time and I order them all together. Um, the way you can do that is when you get your second and third terms. Um, on the right hand side, you would want to change this little and drop down to an or before you click on Add to Search Builder. And when I search PubMed, what will happen is, um, thank you, Chris, is that ultimately all of these searches that I'm going to go into the um, advanced uh, search builder, or basically it's, it's recording your history of what you're doing. 
for that particular computer session. Notice there's a little download link here, kind of um, center right. Um, I'm noting that because if you walk away from your session and come back in two hours, this will have timed out and um, it's kind of nice to be able to have a record of what you did um, to see the logic of your search. So what we're seeing here in the query box is the result of me going into Mesh, doing a search on um, food insecurity and um, seeing that Food supply was also the, the term that was previously used. So I have this big food insecurity concept pile, essentially. Um, I also decided to order poverty in there because food insecurity is very strongly related to poverty. Um, and I, again, I'm kind of really wanting to find more than 12 articles. And then there's, the, there's my tobacco cessation concept pile <laughs> to and these together. I would go to my search history and click in the actions column for the row of the search that I want. And there's a little menu that will come up. The first time you do this, it'll say add to query, which puts it up in the query box. And the second or subsequent items you add will give you the option to add with and or add with or. You'll notice that there, <laughs> each of these got a lot of results 37,000 results for tobacco use cessation, 58,000 for food insecurity. Um, I always think it's interesting to um, and these kind of searches together to see um, how many we get. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And so when I and these together, um, and I really want to emphasize this is one particular search that I might do. Maybe along the way, I find other terms that I want to or in to these concept files. Now I have 456 results, which is great. Um, and it's 456 results, which is a lot. So I probably want to use some of the filters. You can find the, the um, filters on the left-hand side and go to the next slide. Thank you, Chris. Um, these, the filters are actually lined up all in the column on the left-hand side, but obviously power, with PowerPoint, I'm needing to kind of chop it up. Um, uh, yes, so um, <laughs> Chris, do you want me to mention the PubMed timeout duration, or do you want me to do that at the end? Oops. Yeah, there we go. Um, all right, so in terms of filters, um, there's a lot of ways that you can, now that you've expanded your search results, that you can narrow it down so you do not have to go through so many. Uh, free full text is one option. If you are working in the local health department or in the public sector, this can be extremely helpful. It can also be very helpful if you're trying to find research to share with your constituents um, or the people you serve in your county. Um, because free full text means you can share those things with them, no problem. Um, you can limit to article type. So to, if the question calls for it, you could limit to randomized control trial or systematic review. Um, review is a good uh, limit to uh, apply if you are just starting out understanding a particular topic. A review means someone else has gone out and looked at all the literature and is kind of summarizing it. You can limit by date. And you can also, as you scroll down uh, to the bottom of the filter list, there is a link that says additional filters where you can add in options like language and age and sex and so forth. Um, and once those options are on the page, you can click on those checkboxes too as you like. Um, could the, there's a question in the uh, chat, could the mesh terms be uh, searched as major mesh terms instead? Yes, the, um, for those of you who are not familiar with mesh, the, um, the uh, mesh terms are the, uh, it's like the, the hierarchical language that is used to help bring like information together, yes. And um, as Chris is pointing out here, as you can see in the mesh record, there is a link that says PubMed major topic um, on the slide there. So when you do a mesh search, you will have that link. Um, major link just, if you 
make the mesh terms a major topic, what it does is it increases the specificity of your search. Um, in other words, it, it allows you to hone in a lot more on what you're looking for. So if you have searched and you keep getting thousands of items and a lot of them are not exactly on target, then maybe you want to select the mesh term as a major topic. Um, and the opposite would be true if you were not finding anything and um, you, would, you maybe just think, okay, at this point, I just want the article to touch on this concept. Maybe you should back up and just uh, use the mesh topic, even if it appears as a non-major topic. You are welcome. Thank you to the person who asked that. Okay, so we have searched, uh, we have filtered, and we uh, one of the filters I used uh, what allows me to see the articles that are available for free. Here I can see this PMC or PubMed Central link. Um, this uh, uh, this means that I can click on that link and get a free version of this article. Um, what this use often means, uh, well, not always, is that the researchers who produce this research um, got a grant from the NIH. And since 2008, there is a requirement that uh, NIH funded uh, research when it's written up needs to be to provide um, a freely available version to PMC within a certain period of time. And I don't know if that's six months or 18 months. Um, Chris might, Chris or Toby might know. Um, and Chris is 12 like, months. 12 months, thank you very much. Um, okay, so that's for free articles, but what about all the articles that come up that uh, you find that are not free? How do you get a hold of those? Um, <laughs> how you can get, there's a lot of different ways you can get a hold of these. Um, there are tools such as MKWall and Semantic Scholar that will essentially um, identify when you come to a website that has a freely available version of the article you're looking for, um, or it helps you, it will scan this. Semantic Scholar uses artificial intelligence to bring um, a, a bunch of information together. So sometimes you can find a freely available version that way. You can check your public library interlibrary loan service. Often they will they will provide that. Um, sometimes uh, there's a fee. It would really depend on your on your local environment. You could also check your local health sciences library interlibrary loan service. Again, there may be some kind of fee. Um, you'll need to check your local um, institutions. And also, finally, contact the author. They may be able to share a copy or answer your questions. OK. Um, so as Chris referred to earlier, um, trying to use public health terminology in PubMed is often trying to put a square peg into a round hole. PubMed is very clinical medicine and um, biomedically oriented. Um, and so often, there are concepts in public health that um, are not yet represented. Um, so for instance, built environment, which is, uh, is a huge concept in public health, didn't exist as a mesh term until 2019. Previously, you had to search on both the concepts environment design and residence characteristics to get to those articles. And there's other concepts that um, seem like really it took until 2021 to get these concepts as a mesh term, but it's true. So um, I invite you to um, meet with a local um, health sciences librarian or your public librarian um, if, you, if they have um, knowledge of uh, health resources and um, we, can, we can help you figure out uh, different terms to use, both mesh and keyword that can get to all of the information that PubMed has that may have different terminology than what, how we use it in public health. And I am done. So questions about what we covered. And um, there's a question of, are the slides available after the presentation? I believe so. I'm, um, yes. Yeah. Yes, they're definitely going to be, there's going to be a recording and a slides. Um, I also, I want to move on, I think, Laura, for a moment, just to make sure we get through the rest of the content. 
I did want to say that I think Laura mentioned in her comments that PubMed lasts a couple of hours. Technically, the way with cookies it works should be able to keep your search strategies and things up to eight hours. But if you are getting interrupted or sharing computers when you do this work, the best thing you can do is make an account for yourself on the system and save your work as you go along or use the download feature as, as Laura mentioned, because that eight hours goes more quickly than any of us think on a busy day. Um, please do continue to keep asking your questions in the chat and Laura will be able to answer in the chat and then we can surface any that need to come back to the group. So in terms of looking at the next question to shift gears about the community members reporting that there's noise in their community with cooling towers and that they're interested in whether this is violating a local noise ordinance. This, this concern really raises multiple questions for searching. One is looking for air conditioning noise complaint reports or publications. And then the second is to look for research or technical articles about the accuracy of using smartphone, personal smartphones as noise measurement devices. So I'd love for you to take a minute to think about your response to these questions about the scenario. Who would have been gathering this type of information to make it publicly available? Where or what databases might you search in to look for information on these topics, understanding that you might use different databases for the first question piece of this versus the second question? And then Laura had just mentioned terminology. What terms or what approaches might you use? So just kind of take a minute and, and think about that, and then we'll share our initial thoughts on that. So in terms of part one, which is looking for the noise complaint reports or publications, and I'll take a crack at that one before I turn it over to Tova to talk about the smartphones. I think about the fact that noise is both an environmental issue and an occupational issue often, and that reporting is often a governmental agency issue. Sometimes it's local and sometimes it's federal, depending on where, where the noise is being reported. So I think about the question of who studies noise, and in my case, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, came to mind. And so in their technical manual, they have a very thorough document on noise which is good background for how we measure it and what organizations study it. Um, one agency that came up in that is that the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, is a group that cares about noise. Um, and so this group produces a custom online database called NIOSH TIC2 of occupational safety and health publications that were reported by their agency. Now, this isn't going to be the case for every kind of question that you have, but it's always worth thinking about, is somebody else already doing the work to kind of gather up all of these resources or a good chunk of these resources so that you can look in something that's specific to occupational health or environmental health as opposed to looking globally at something like PubMed that covers occupational health, environmental health, and a lot of other things. So I started thinking about the words that would likely be in these materials and then the same steps that Laura showed you for PubMed about looking at your results and looking for full text are the next step and then deciding in this case how to share the findings versus do you just let them know that this is a publicly available data source that they could actually search on their own. So this is the search screen for NIOSH TIC2. And as Laura mentioned for PubMed, there is both the basic search, which is just kind of the single search box and an advanced search box. And so in thinking about my terminology, if you look in the type right, top right corner of this screen, I was interested in the concept of noise. And I couldn't think of a lot of other variant comments for noise at this moment, but I thought about a lot of other things besides air conditioning. So I thought about air conditioning or HVAC systems or cooling. And so I used parentheses to group those concepts about the air conditioning noise and combine them with or, and then use and to kind of combine that with the concept of noise. And there were 52 results in the basic search. Um, but I wanted to see whether the advanced search could help me figure out anything different or give me more detail because those words were just kind of showing up anywhere. And so in the, the advanced search, you see that you can search for these terms in the title of the publication. You can search for them in all fields. The downside is that you can only search one of those concepts at a time in each box. So I couldn't do 
air conditioning or HVAC or cooling all in once, I had to do one at a time, which is different. In PubMed, you could actually do all of them at the same time. But the other thing that you see here are that the limit searches choices. And on the right-hand side, we can narrow this by publication date, but I wanna point out the area with the blue arrow that this is searching several different kinds of information. And one of those is health hazard evaluation reports. And so if you were looking specifically for those kind of reports, you could limit your search to those kind of reports. In our case, we're just interested in any report, so I'm not going to choose that limit. So here are the four results for combining a search for noise and HVAC. And I want to just call your attention to, you see that it's highlighting in yellow where your terms showed up. And sometimes your, your term is not exactly what's going to be in the title. So the titles I find are always, you need to often go deeper than the titles. So if you look at number two, environmental noise impacting a neighborhood, this is actually what I'm interested in. It doesn't have as many of my terms showing up in the title, but remember I said it could be searching anywhere. So somewhere in this document, we'll go to the next screen in a minute, you'll see, it must be talking about HVAC systems. And so what we have in these results is a conference proceedings and scientific articles that were supported by NIOSH funding. So this is the cl clicking on to see the more detailed record for the environmental noise paper. And you see, I think there's two things I'd like to point out here. One is that um, down at the bottom, you see that you have more specific keywords. So this can help you with those iterative versions of your search that Laura mentioned. Um, but also you see there's quite a bit of detail in the abstract itself. This is a conference abstract and the link is the full text link to the conference abstract. So this is the information that's available, but it talks about the noise ordinance of the city, the measurements, and a lot of the details that you might find necessary to address this as an example. So I know that that was a very brief, very fast tour of NIOSH TIC2, and the main point of this isn't so that you necessarily know how to search NIOSH TIC, it's so that you think about the fact that there might be very specific specialty databases to address the kind of question that you're interested in seeing. Um, if there are any questions about NIOSH TIC, I can try to take them now and I can then turn it over to Tova. We do have a question in chat on NIOSH TIC. Okay. Is there a lot of duplication between what can be found in NIOSH TIC and Quebec? So yes, yeah, so the question of duplication, I think that yes, there are some journals that are covered by PubMed that are journals in which people publish NIOSH funded work. And so that's where the overlap would be. Um, the, the publications in NIOSH TIC would be funded by NIOSH. And so some of them are gonna be in journals that are in PubMed and some of them will not be journals that are in PubMed. PubMed doesn't cover conference proceedings, so I think most of the conference proceedings that are in NIOSH TIC would not would be unique to NIOSH, would not be unique to NIOSH TIC, but would not be overlap. And then all of those health hazard evaluation and reports and things like that would not be overlap because PubMed really only covers primarily journal articles. Okay, so now uh, we wanna move on to the second part of our question concerning um, whether smartphones are really accurate for measuring noise. Um, and if you remember um, when we looked on the previous slide or you may have noticed that that abstract included information about the dosimeters that were used to capture the noise in that particular study. So understanding how these kinds of dosimeters compared to smartphone phones um, is going to be helpful in knowing whether using smartphones to measure noise is going to be a useful approach uh, for the community. So because we're trying to focus on papers that are going to be more available to you, as well as relevant to your question, um, in this case, we're going to start with the database Google Scholar. So in addition to articles, uh, Google Scholar also has available um, dissertations and theses, uh, patents, legal cases, and other kinds of information. So what we've done here is a fairly simple search in Google Scholar of smartphone and noise or sound and measurement um, to see what comes up. So now we'll go to the next slide. Thank you. 
um, where we'll see some of the results that came up for this search. So first of all, you may notice that um, some of the results appearing at the top of the search results uh, search results page here are older articles. Um, for example, that top article is from 2014, and the one below that is from 2016. And that's because the way that Google's ranking algorithm works, um, the more highly cited articles will tend to be pushed toward the top. And you might imagine that those may tend to be older articles. Um, but you can imagine for our question, uh, given the speed at which technology changes, we would prefer to look at more recent articles. So we can use the filters and the limits on the side to either limit to the most recent articles or to sort by date. And I also just wanna point out while we're here that you can also create an alert for a search um, by clicking on that envelope icon if desired and you would be emailed when new articles come in matching your search term. Okay, so we could go to, thank you. <laughs> so for our example, I decided to limit to articles published since 2020 uh, to get the more recent articles. And you see that the first few results listed here are from 2020. Now, any freely available articles will have a link provided on the right, um, as you can see here for the second article that came up in our results. Now, if there's no link provided, like for the first and the third uh, results listed here, then those articles are not going to be freely available. And you'd have to explore other options for obtaining them um, if you were interested in uh, getting the full text of those. And we'll get into that a little more in a minute. Thank you. So once you've completed your search, you're going to identify relevant articles. And we're looking for papers that convince us that yes, you know, using smartphones to measure noise is a good idea, or no, it's not a good idea. And ideally, we want to find free articles, um, because since the community is asking us, we want to be able to provide those articles to the community members to say, yes, using smartphones in this way is a good idea, or no, it's not going to be a good idea, and here's why, and then provide them with the scientific literature that we're basing our conclusions on. Also, if the literature is saying, you know, yes, smartphone performance is pretty good, and it's recommending a particular app or something else, we might pass that on to the user and say, well, if you're th really thinking about doing this, you know, here's a paper that describes something that works pretty well for that, that you might want to try. Okay, next slide. Um, so any questions? We don't have point? a lot of time, to, but no? we might just want to keep going <laughs> so keep for keep now. Going. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> All right. Um, so now that we've talked about finding articles that are available through PubMed, NIOSH Tech 2, and Google Scholar, uh, we want to bring the conversation around to options for sharing the findings of your searching with your team members or people in the community. So the simplest approach is where people have an email address and the resources you found are available on public websites. And you're able to just you know give them the link and say here's what i searched for here's what i found and here's the link to what i think you would find to be helpful information now if what you want for them instead is to see the wealth of literature that's out there because you don't know which of the many things that you found would be useful to them um, this is where it could be a good example to offer your search strategy so you say you know i search pubmed and here's the link to pubmed and then here's the search strategy that i used and you can run the search strategy as well and you'll see all of the results that came up and you can choose what's relevant to you now sometimes we pair the two approaches up so we give them the search strategy but then we also give them you know a couple of citations or abstract and um tell them why we chose those and if we can provide them with the full text of the articles, great. Um, but if they're not full text, uh, we'll add some information on how they can obtain the full text of articles, which again, may be their public library or another local library. Now, if what you're sending out has health information embedded in it, we tend to be very careful and include a disclaimer. And I've put the disclaimer that we use here on the slide. Um, now, your organization may already have a disclaimer for that you use when answering these kind of questions, but if not, you're free to tweak this one that we use um, for your organization. And then lastly, if you're providing them with copyrighted articles or materials that are coming from a subscription 
or that you yourself have obtained from another library, usually under copyright law, then those copies are made available to you for personal use only. So if you're sharing them out to a third party audience, we generally try to clarify that they should only be shared with their care provider or someone who's immediately involved in the situation um, because the copyright doesn't really allow for them to further post or share content that was given to them under the copyright exception for personal or research use. Um, sometimes when there's a community involved, there may be a desire to share it more broadly so this is why we try to focus on free and open access materials. Um, okay, so to summarize um, this slide on getting access to resources, uh, we know that in public health organizations, many of you will not have your own library or access to databases or article requesting services through your agency. So in terms of referrals to academic or specialty libraries, um, we just wanna emphasize a couple of things. Um, that libraries with health sciences collections are usually a part of this interlibrary loan network that's available to all types of public and state libraries. So that's certainly the first and the best option is to reach out to your state or public library to see if you can get the resources you need through their interlibrary loan service. And often um, this service is provided for free. Um, under normal access conditions, so pre-pandemic, before things were closed down, uh, members of the public were welcome to visit most academic libraries to be able to use their computers or bring in their own device um, and be on their Wi-Fi and therefore be able to access the library's online resources. Um, so if you're close to an academic institution, that might be an option. Um, and you can find your closest health sciences library or member library of the network of the National Library of Medicine by searching this directory here um, at the link that's um, included on the bottom of the slide. Um, we at OHSU, OHSU are happy to help you kind of navigate this if you have questions, um, so contact us. All right, I'm gonna turn it over Great. to Chris. So since we just have a minute or two left together, we're not going to go into these additional multidisciplinary resources on the slides, but you'll have them in terms of the video and the slide deck. They're just examples of questions that really have more specific resources and collaborations in mind. And so I think what we'll do is just stop here. And again, this is our contact information. If there's questions in the chat, I know Laura's been answering some of them. I haven't seen any of them because I've been sharing the slide deck, but we do have about one minute to take any questions um, verbally or we can continue. We are happy to stay on a few extra minutes and address any questions in the chat. Are there any questions, Laura, in the chat that need to be surfaced to the, the high level? Um, I'm, I'm answering one right now. I don't see one that needs to be surfaced to the high level, but anonymous attendee, I am about to answer your question about uh, the evaluating websites. Okay, great. Well, we'll stay on for a few minutes to answer question in the chat, but I want to be respectful of everybody who has a hard stop at 45 after. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it back over to Nora to see if there's anything else. Thank you. Um, that was a great presentation. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat box for the evaluation. And for those of you who are claiming CHES credit, uh, just fill out that evaluation. And even if you're not, we'd love to hear from you. Um, are there any more questions? Let's see. Great. Well, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate being able to be part of this community and we'll take a closer look at the chat and make sure we haven't missed anything. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. And um, somebody asked, how do we get the slides? Every, there will be a recording posted to our NNLM YouTube channel and everyone who attended will get an email with that link that should come within two weeks. I think the, the question, Nora, about slides is maybe there's some things in the slides they'd like to be able to copy and paste out or use, and we'd be happy to do that. So do, do can we actually also make the slides available, not just the video maybe? Is that what the question is also? That sounds wonderful. Yeah, if you can provide the slides, we would be happy to send them out to everybody. Great, we'll do that. Thanks everyone.
Thank you. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.